So the structure of the lecture first is um, going to give you an overview, a background of how this platform came to be and how the platform is uh, performing at the moment. And then uh, Joe will give you a very detailed explanation of how we perform open peer review um, in, in ORAE. And then finally, uh, it will be back to me to do a wrap up and then we open the floor for um, questions. So yeah, the how um, did Open Research Europe um, start? So the idea um, started uh, from the European Commission a few years um, ago, and they wanted to uh, launch a publishing platform. So they um, put out a call for tender, a public procurement process that was won by the publisher F1000, and they signed a contract together in March 2020 for uh, 5.8 uh, million euros with a duration of four years. In this contract, we have a partner with uh, different um, researcher associations like the Global Young Academy, the LIBA, the Librarians of uh, Europe, and Eurodoc, uh, who represents uh, PhD students in Europe. They uh, work as collaborators with us and they help us with the communication and sustainability of the platform. As you can imagine, they have uh, really good uh, networks and they um, serve us as a point of contact with the researchers. We further partner with Open Air to help us with the syndication of the platform and as well with the communication of it. And uh, this platform is uh, for beneficiaries of Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe and Euratom uh, funding uh, programs. Um, it was launched in March 2021 is when we officially uh, launched the platform and it was uh, open for uh, researchers to submit their publications. And at the moment we have 264 uh, publications. So why did the um, European Commission wanted to launch their own publishing platform as opposed to um, a traditional journal? So they were um, they wanted to uh, make open access compliance uh, 100 percent. Um, right now, beneficiaries of uh, these programs, they um, they have to publish their research in open access venue, but it's not uh, mandatory which venue they choose. So the European Commission wanted them to offer a venue uh, for them to comply 100% with this uh, open access um, guidelines. So um, the platform, they wanted to design a platform that was high quality, reliable and efficient a venue for their beneficiaries to publish their, their research. We follow very high scientific standards and transparent processes that I will um, comment a bit uh, more later. We um, have an expert scientific advisory board that was uh, chosen by the European Commission. So this board consists of uh, 24 members distributed along um, different countries within the within Europe. Um, sadly, we don't have any representative from Slovenia. Uh, and it's uh, we try to cover all uh, career stages and as well is 50% uh, uh, gender balanced. Um, but most importantly, uh, the European Commission wanted to create this platform that will allow beneficiaries to publish their research at no cost to the benef to the to the researchers. So we follow a diamond model um, by which the the APCs I cover are covered centrally by the funder, in this case, the European Commission. And also, um, they also wanted to make sure that the beneficiaries could publish their research, even though the grant they were using for that had already finished. So they didn't have to um, worry or rush into uh, publishing all the results just before the grant um, finished, because otherwise they wouldn't have um, funding for that. The ambitions of uh, with launching such a different uh, platform uh, with uh, such a different uh, model, if we were to compare with um, other journals too, is that they wanted to lead by example uh, with regards uh, of uh, open science principles uh, in, in scholarly publishing. And they also wanted to give um, the researchers uh, the possibility to explore, to explore different ways of uh, publishing, different uh, business models. So the highlight of uh, what makes us different is that we follow um, open peer review process that Joe will explain later, and we uh, very much facilitate early sharing of uh, research and data. 
we publish uh, the articles immediately, even before the peer review process um, is completed. So obviously this increases the um, accessibility of the articles and um, they are out there for uh, other researchers and for research to be uh, built upon uh, immediately. We generate new article metrics and um, yeah, we'll explain that a little bit more later. And as I was saying before, uh, we really want to be very transparent and cost effective. Um, and with that, um, our APCs, the price that the European Commission pays per article that we publish is seven, um, 780 euros per article. That, um, so if you compare with the price tag in other journals, you will see that it's quite, it's quite low. And apart from that, what we have done, we have um, uh, defined eight distinct categories that are required for articles to be published. So we are talking about, uh, for example, uh, peer review management or the platform development. And we um, have assigned the percentage within seven, this uh, 780 euros to have a clear understanding of how much of this money it goes to uh, each of these categories. So as you can see here, most of it, uh, the 28% goes towards uh, pre-publication checks to publication, 21% is peer review management, and the 14th percent is the platform development. So it's um, they wanted to make a statement that uh, you can publish your research in a high quality venue without necessarily having to break the bank. And all this information is, uh, um, is available in our uh, platform. If you click here, uh, it will direct you and you can check this information as well. So just to um, deep uh, dwell a little bit more about what we do, as I was mentioned, we publish original peer review articles um, stemming from um, the, Horizon Pro, the Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe and Eurotom funded research. We uh, offer immediate open access uh, and all our articles are published under um, CCBI um, Creative Commons license, so it allows um, reuse of the content and the copyright is retained by the authors. We have an open peer review uh, model. Uh, the identities of the reviewers are published on the platform as well as the reports that they write about the article and we even allow comments uh, from different users to uh, to be uh, published on on the platform commenting the the article. We also um, have uh, made an effort to make all um, our content um, text and my and data mine aidable, so all the content is interoperable. Um, our articles um, have persistent identifiers, DOIs, as well as the um, uh, reports from the peer reviewers. We uh, uh, work on an open uh, data and open software policy as well. So we, allow, we ask our authors to deposit all the data in appropriate um, repositories. And about the new generation metrics, as I was uh, mentioning before, um, I'm sure that you might have heard of the concept of uh, impact factor. So Open Research Europe does not have an impact factor, and this is uh, very much the decision from the European Commission that they don't want to put the focus on um, journal level metrics, but they want to focus on the content, but not where it's published. This yeah. is uh, much following the, um, the lines of other movements like the Leyden Manifesto and the DORA um, Research Assessment Declaration, which I believe uh, Maribor University is a signatory of. So the metrics that we have uh, and each article, uh, we use metrics at the article level. So each article would have a dedicated tab for its metrics where you can see um, how many times it has been viewed, how many times it has been downloaded, um, cited, and we even pull out um, the all metrics information that accounts for the online presence of that specific article. So if that article has been uh, tweeted or it hasn't been uh, written a, a blog about, it will appear um, there. Uh, then, as I was mentioning, uh, we uh, uh, strive to be very transparent and all our policies and all the article guidelines and or um, how we perform and how we work, uh, um, how we run the platform is in our website. We obviously um, uh, take the burden of researcher of, um, when it comes to open access um, compliance. 
uh, because we will do all that is required for them. Um, so with um, Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, the researchers, they have, as I was mentioning, they have to publish in open access. And then after that, they have to send their articles um, to repositories. So we do that for them, whereas if they publish in another journal, they will have to do that themselves to send it into an appropriate repository for that article to be there, to be held indefinitely. And um, Open Research Europe is just following the example of um, what other funders have done. So uh, we have other platforms that are also run by F1000. This is the case of Welcome Open Research, which is the publishing platform for um, the Welcome Trust, which is a charity uh, that is quite generous here in the in the UK. And we uh, um, also run the platforms of other funders like um, the Bill and Belinda. Uh, Gates Foundation and also HRB, which is a funder within Ireland. So now I'd like to give you an overview of how the platform um, is doing, how we are performing so far. So we have, as I was mentioning, 264 published articles, and of those, uh, 206 have completed peer review, um, around 78%. And of those that have completed peer review, 71 have passed uh, peer review. In terms of the different article types that we publish, uh, you have you can see here in the pie chart that uh, we mostly publish research article, uh, research articles like 51%, uh, but we also um, offer different type of article types in order to try to capture all the research outputs from our researchers. And you can see that they are benefit from these other um, article types like the method articles or um, software tool articles. At the moment, um, we are our all our um, articles are indexed in Google Scholar, and after they have passed peer review, they are sent to um, appropriate bibliographic databases. And um, we have been indexed so far in Inspec, which is a um, database uh, relevant for engineering and um, technology content, as well as in Scopus and Eris Plus. Um, Scopus and Eris Plus, we have uh, been accepted in July, so we are not indexed just yet, but uh, it was a major ma milestone to uh, validate us as, a, as another uh, a good alternative for, for publishing. And Scopus, in the case of Scopus, they um, receive content from all different subject areas, whereas in Eris Plus is um, more towards social sciences. So the subject areas we have uh, content from are the ones you can see on the on the screen. So agricultural and veterinary sciences, engineering and technology, humanities and the arts, medical and health sciences, natural sciences, which includes uh, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics, computer and information sciences and earth and environmental sciences and social sciences. Um, at the moment, um, we have the most content we have is coming from social sciences with 29%, uh, followed by engineering and technology with 26 and then natural sciences with uh, 22. Yeah. And with this, uh, we want to make sure that uh, all different subject areas are represented in our uh, platform and more or less following the funding that they have um, received. So as I was mentioning, we have uh, so many different subject areas, which is uh, quite is not very useful for um, other journals because they will specify on a specific um, topic. So in order to make the um, user experience a bit more um, comfortable and um, easy, we have developed um, dedicated sections, uh, which we call community gateways that um, house all the content that is related to a um, specific subject area. So in the case here, I just have a screenshot of um, the website of the page that has all the community gateways. So for example, in to um, for chemistry, we have a community gateway that is in organic chemistry, another one that is uh, organic chemistry in order to uh, group together similar content uh, together and to um, help users and, and readers finding the content that they are interested in. These community gateways are led by advisors who are experts um, on their field and also they help us with um, 
uh, defining the the scope of the community gallery with the title. They and they also help us with the dissemination with the dissemination of um, of the platform. So we tend to recruit people that are very strong advocacy advocates of um, open access principles. In the same way and uh, with a um, much smaller scope, we also have collections that um, are compilations of content funded by um, Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe communities projects, or we can even we can even have um, collections that are uh, specifically launched for um, conferences, as you can see here. And again, these ones are also um, led by guest advisors, but in this case, they are researchers that hold that held um, Horizon 2020 or Horizon Europe or Euratom uh, funded funding. So if they would like to publish their research with us, they can do so. And this obviously will send a very strong message that they are very committed with the platform if they themselves publish their, their research with us. Um, I was mentioning before that we have different article types, and this is something that uh, the European Commission wanted to be very committed with and to um, offer researchers with the possibility of uh, publishing any research output that they um, obtain from their research activity and not just the typical and final research article. So the idea is that we want to accompany researchers along their um, journey. So at the start, if they would like to publish a review or um, study protocol, as well as a brief report, and obviously we also offer a research article and brief reports, and um, as well as articles that are usually not present in other journals, like the software um, tool articles. So these usually are uh, present in the materials and methods on the supplementary uh, section and then the people who have work uh, uh, creating the code are not um, recognized um, as they should. Because we have uh, different subject areas, uh, we are aware that uh, these different subject areas will have different types of um, research output and so we offer the article types that we offer are subject specific. So for example, in social sciences and humanities and the arts, we offer them to publish essays, but it doesn't make much more sense to offer an essay in um, natural sciences, for example. So it's just a, here an overview of the different article types that we offer um, and uh, according to the different um, subject areas. OK, so now um, I'm just going to give you an overview of how uh, our publishing model works. So it starts with um, the article submissions by the authors. Uh, this is received by our mm -hmm. pre-publication um, pre-pubs team that uh, they run some checks that I will explain later. And then the uh, once they are happy with the answers that they receive from the authors, the article is published on the platform. So uh, and then after the article has been published in the platform is when the uh, peer review process starts. And this is something um, Joe will explain in a minute. But once the the articles have passed peer review, they are sent to indexers and repositories. And I just wanted to mention um, here that uh, we also um, are happy to receive negative and null results as well as confirmatory results. But we uh, want to uh, work on a sound science um, journal. So uh, we tell our peer reviewers to assess the quality of the article, not based on the potential novelty or um, possible impact, but whether the uh, methodology and the data presented that, uh, there is um, rigorous. That's why it, um, this follows along the lines of why we don't have uh, an impact factor, because we are more worried about the content rather than um, not using um, article metrics responsibly. The, just to give you an overview of the kind of checks we do when we receive um, an article, uh, our team in the pre team will check that the article is original, so we cannot publish articles that um, have been published elsewhere or that they are under revision in another um, journal. So we run a plagiarism check and we use the um, software called Authenticate that will tell us uh, what percentage of that content has already been published elsewhere. 
We also check that the articles are readable in English to help the peer review process, but also um, the readers. At the moment, we only publish in English. We also check the data availability. So as I was mentioning, we um, ask the authors to include a data availability st statement, even if they don't have any data, because we want them to deposit all the underlying data in an approved repository, and this will help uh, with um, fight the crisis of uh, reproducibility in research. We also check the authorship criteria because only um, authors that uh, with a specific funding can publish with us. So we obviously ask them for the grant ID and we check that it corresponds to that person and um, they work in the uh, university that they should work as well. Uh, our team also analyzes the method and they check that the methods are reproducible and um, easy to understand that the article is adhering with the guideline, guidelines of that specific article type, because maybe sometimes um, author, uh, they want to publish a specific article type, but it doesn't follow all the sections that they should. So our um, prepub team, they can um, suggest to change the article type. And we also uh, check for ethical approval. We check if uh, eth ethical approval is needed. And uh, if not, we um, query the authors if they can if they can give confirmation of, of uh, why not. And um, just to uh, give a bit more of um, explanation about our data deposition. So we follow uh, the principle of um, the data should be as open as possible, but as close as necessary. So uh, we are aware that um, we want the data to be um, deposited in repositories, but we also want to protect the confidentiality, security and privacy of uh, the individuals. Uh, if we are talking about uh, that is a study that it involves um, individuals, we will respect the terms of consent by individuals who were involved in that um, research. And of course, we will follow the um, um, legal um, guidelines uh, of Horizon uh, Europe, Horizon 2020 and Euratom. And um, we also understand that in some cases um, it won't be possible to share all the data uh, publicly, but still we will ask our authors to allow access to the data on um, with uh, with required access. So if someone uh, would like to access that data, they can contact the authors and they can um, give them access to it. And here I just uh, put an example of um, how our data availability statements um, look like. So. At the beginning, it's just a brief uh, description of what um, the data is, and then you have the links towards uh, the different uh, repositories. Uh, the same here with the extended data. Uh, extended data could be the equivalent of supplementary material in other journals. We don't support that because what usually happens is that the supplementary material are converted into PDFs and then they are rendered useless uh, because you cannot um, have a way of a citing uh, a PDF it does if, if it does not have a DOI. So if you deposit the data in a repository, it will receive a DOI and that it will link um, this data towards the article. And then if you a researcher uses this uh, data, the author who um, created it will be cited appropriately. Um, something we don't host the data ourselves uh, is hosted in uh, these repositories that I was um, talking about. We have a list on our website of approved repositories. Mainly what we are looking for is uh, for the for the data to receive a persistent identifier so it can be cited and also uh, the fact that it needs to be held indefinitely. So if an author suggests to deposit the data in a repository that requires an annual fee, this is something that uh, we will ask them to choose a different repository because you cannot um, guarantee that the data is going to be there forever. And here I just want to, this, this will be the final process once the article uh, has passed all these checks. This is how it will look in our platform. This is um, an example. As you can see here, it's very clear whether an article has past peer review or not, because um, here on the right uh, it says that it's waiting peer review and also um, at the end of the title in square brackets, you can see that is this article has not passed peer review. So we want to distinguish very clearly what is peer review and what has not been peer reviewed yet. And um, yeah, I think now um, Joe will give you 
an overview of how we do a peer review now. So I'll pass over to you. I will pass your the slides for you. Microphone. Apologies. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so I'm going to explain in a bit more depth how our open peer review model uh, works and how the peer review process takes place com uh, transparently. Give you a breakdown of our like sort of standard peer review workflow from pre-publication to new versions and eventually passing peer review as well as explaining the role of the editorial team and how we act as intermediaries between authors and reviewers. I'll show you uh, an example of good practice kind of in engaging with more, uh, open peer review. So as mentioned, ORE op operates a post-publication peer review model. Um, the article is published quickly after the checks that Alicia has outlined to ensure that research is out there for people to look at and use in their own studies. We then solely rely on peer reviewers to critically evaluate each article to ensure that the research and the data is as valid as possible. But this is different from the traditional model where there might be an academic editor who has the final decision on whether an article passes peer review or not and interprets the uh, judgment made by peer reviewers. Here it's entirely dictated by the reviewers that we invite. Um, so at the start of the process, um, we'll ask authors to suggest peer reviewers for their paper at the pre-publication stage. And, we do this to ensure that the most qualified reviewers take a look at the article. We basically believe this author-led approach, you know, authors will know the best people in their field to review their work, and authors are asked to submit suggested reviewers as the final part of the pre-publication process. And um, again, this may differ from many traditional models that you might be used to, where academic editors may take the lead in suggesting and inviting reviewers for papers, um, and where the identities of reviewers may be unknown to authors because they're undertaking, undertaking single blind or double blind peer review. Um, and authors are looking for reviewers to suggest at this uh, pre-publication stage. We recommend that they consider maybe their own citations, uh, people that they've cited in their article or scholars working in major labs or research groups within their fields as a starting point for recommendations. Really, you know, if you're an expert in the field, you probably do have a good sense of who are the other experts who would be well placed to um, to assess your work. We do, as mentioned in this slide here, also uh, provide a peer review selector tool. Um, so this is something that uh, you can access through the RRE portal that will generate suggested reviewers based on um, your article title, its abstract, its um, citation details. I will say, you know, this tool can be something of an instrument, especially outside of the life sciences, and that's kind of where it does its best work. And if you are using it to suggest reviewers, you should always kind of like double check that the, the people, it's the names that it's suggesting are, um, you know, kind of actually qualified fit would be able to assess the article. Um, and so before an article can be published, basically, we ask uh, the author to suggest at least five reviewers and we ask for this many basically to reduce the chance of delays as uh, when we send out invites to reviewers many may be busy when first approached and it's good to have like you know sort of multiple invites at once give us the best chance of getting uh, reviewers ready and uh, getting reviewers agreed and ready to provide peer review reports uh, if we can click through to the next slide please perfect um so the reviewer suggestion uh, suggested by the authors also have to meet our reviewer criteria, which you can um, see laid out here. So one of the main roles of the editorial team and uh, the peer review team is to do thorough checks of all our reviewers, such as looking at their expertise and whether they've worked with the authors recently, to make sure everything is above board. Um, so the things that we're looking out for is that reviewers are qualified. So across academic disciplines, we look for reviewers to have an appropriate qualification, such as a PhD or an MD. Uh, though we appreciate that in some disciplines, and especially for all of us working in industry or uh, maybe outside of traditional like kind of academic institutions, they may not necessarily have a specific qualification, and we are open to considering other forms of demonstrable expertise, which can be flagged to our peer review team when suggesting reviewers. We're also supportive of early career re researchers and graduate students taking part in peer review, but because of, uh, but often we would um, ask that they co-review a paper, basically alongside a more established scholar. Um, and this is, a, I think, a good way of allowing um, graduate students in particular who are often 
involved in ghostwriting peer review reports and not receiving credit to actually kind of get trained up in the discipline of peer review whilst receiving credit for their work and talk about that a bit later in terms of when we talk about review of benefits on this. The other thing that we're looking for again is like sort of demonstrable um, evidence of their expertise and specifically in terms of like within a publication environment. So we generally look for a publication record as evidence of expertise on a topic as well as for familiarity with the peer review process. As you can see here, Basically, you want someone who has at least three articles as a lead author in a relevant topic and should publish fairly recently, at least within the last five years on the topic. You know, someone who's engaged in that kind of research um, community and actively engaged with research. Um, the other big thing that we check for as a peer review team is impartiality. So it's important that reviewers are not close collaborators with authors, and it's particularly important in this author led. Uh, process that the editorial team double check all suggestions and we consider close collaboration to have been co-authoring with any of the authors on, um, on either upcoming publications or articles published in the previous three years and also sharing an institutional affiliation with an author on the paper so people obviously shouldn't be recommending people from the same department or faculty of themselves or anyone that they work quite closely with and um, other examples of potentially uh disqualifying um, conflicts of interest include uh, perhaps you know the re a, an author recommending their PhD supervisor or potentially some financial competing interests. Uh, the peer review team will uh, undertake checks on all of these kind of potential CRIs and get back to the authors if they discover something that we believe wouldn't allow a reviewer to review a paper. Uh, the other thing that we ask for which is probably different from quite a lot of publications is for reviewers to be global and diverse. Basically, this is to ensure that um, reviewers that the article is being reviewed from, you know, kind of multiple research perspectives and uh, is also kind of uh, allowing it to be assessed by the international community. Research has been done uh, previously that shows that peer reviewers from the same country are, uh, are often more likely to sort of agree and confirm on status, and especially if they're from the same uh, base of the institution as the same country as the author. So we see this as a way of like kind of being in line with uh, the wider goals of the Euro European Commission and Horizon 2020 of um, making sure that research is validated in the eyes of the international research community. Um, Occasionally, papers will also require additional expertise. So if you've got specific statistical analysis within a paper or is a specific method uh, that needs to be assessed, we may require that at least one of the suggestions, you know, can, uh, at least one or two of the suggestions can address that part of the paper. Um, and there is a way that that can be indicated by reviewers if they have their expertise when they're filling in the peer review forms. So once you've got five reviewers that fit those um, criteria your paper can be published and this is basically where the peer review team come in acting as a key intermediary between authors and reviewers so authors and reviewers should never really be in direct contact because that has a potential to influence the outcome of peer review or invalidate the peer review process so what happens uh, myself and other people on the peer review team we set about inviting reviewers and we send them out free invites over a period of two weeks basically to make sure you know we've got the best chance of contacting with them and if we haven't heard back from them at that point we can go back to the author and say we may need more suggestions and things along those lines but once a reviewer has agreed to review we'll send them reminders and negotiate extensions with them if they cannot meet their originally agreed deadline which is usually we hope to uh, for review to be provided two weeks after acceptance of an invitation and obviously we can't be flexible around these things noting that you know kind of peer review is going on alongside many of the other responsibilities of researchers and um, in the case that none of the original reviewers suggestions are available to review we will contact authors for further suggestions and we can also as an editorial team provide additional support in helping to find reviewers as the process goes on but most of the time hopefully we try and get uh, reviewers out of those original five suggestions um yeah and to re uh, reassert as well communication should be handled by the peer review team at all times between author and reviewers um, and I'll explain what these statuses that you can see on the uh, left are in a bit, because that's one of the more unique aspects of our peer review, um, our peer review process. But if we click onto the next slide, I can kind of explain what goes on with providing a peer review report and a publishable peer review report. 
Perfect. So when a reviewer agrees and submits a peer review report, the editorial team are responsible for ensuring it meets our quality standards, um, which basically means that we're looking for reports that are constructive and useful to uh, the authors, but also, you know, kind of legible to wider readers of um, Open Research Europe and are of publishable quality. So how do we ensure good quality in peer review reports? Well, we like to provide as much guidance as possible to reviewers, and crucially, we tailor our peer review criteria to each different type of article. You saw all the different types of articles and subjects that we offer, as Alicia laid out earlier, as well as to broader subject areas. And we've got like sort of specific variations and questions for STEM subjects, for social sciences and humanities. Uh, so what you see here is the online report form for a research article. And as you can see, uh, reviewers, this is what the review themselves will see when they log into our online platform to um, submit their review. And you can see there are a series of questions we ask reviewers to answer that must be completed to submit the reports. And they basically kind of provide the outline and criteria of what they really should be assessing when they look at an article. And these questions also should provide a useful guide of what reviewers should write in the text box you see here. So basically what we ask for from a good review is that it should provide a brief summary of the article and its conclusions before outlining any questions, clarifications or concerns the reviewers have. have. Feedback given a report should be specific and actionable. We ask reviewers to focus on the content of the article rather than perceived novelty or originality. Uh, as an editorial team, we'll provide very minor edits of peer review reports, mostly fixing spelling mistakes. Um, as for transparency purposes, it's really vital for us to maintain the reviewer's voice. But if we find any uh, peer review reports don't kind of meet our standard, maybe they're too brief or it's not clear what they're asking the authors to correct when it, uh, when they have said, like, you know, there's issues that prevent the paper from passing peer review, then we'll go back to the uh, reviewers and ask for clarifications and any more significant changes basically obviously have to be signed off by the reviewers themselves because it's them who are, you know, they're the experts, they're the ones who are passing judgment on the article. Um, the report form also contains a section where reviewers can provide citations of, uh, of research that they mentioned in their report. And this has a great transparency benefit in terms of it allows the authors and wider readers to engage with any literature the reviewer believes should be cited. So, you know, kind of it's not the authors aren't left to go away and find this literature themselves. It's kind of linked out directly from the report and obviously other readers can see this as well. Uh, and we do ask reviewers to provide reasoning for any citations they ask the authors to add to their articles, particularly if it's their own work. I mean, it's a good thing as well there because obviously um, reviewers' names and affiliations are attached to articles. It's clear to see when someone is saying, like, you know, kind of you might want to consider the research that I've done in this area, but we just make that process a whole lot more transparent. And um, so next slide, please. Thank you very much. So as mentioned previously with the open review process, reviewers names and affiliations are listed. We also ask reviewers to list their expertise. This is particularly valuable when an article is multidisciplinary and a reviewer can only assess one aspect. Um, and these are all basically displayed alongside the article itself, as are the peer review reports. So um, the peer review reports themselves have a DOI. A link to the article and then as you can see here we have the names of reviewers uh, and we have the um, affiliations the universities that they're at we also have the box that says there's what their expertise is and what from what perspective they're reviewing the article and also any non-disqualifying uh, competing interests can be declared in the article itself um, and these are, will be the phrasing of these COIs will be like sort of agreed with the peer review team and just again it allows us for full transparency in terms of who's reviewing the article, what perspective they're coming from and things along those lines. As you can see here we have an example of a co-reviewed peer review report. I mentioned this earlier, co-reviewing I think is really great and particularly beneficial for graduate students or junior scholars who might have not have previous um, expertise of writing peer review reports, but may be able to work alongside a um, senior uh, academic. And it, uh, basically being named on the report allows them to receive appropriate credit for their work, demonstrates expertise in the topic, and basically shows that they're an active participant in the scholarly community. Um, so these are obligations for reviewers in many ways to provide their names, their expertise and conflicts of interest, but they're also like, you know, a benefit by showing they are proper open research advocates, as it were. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, I'll uh, 
explain perhaps one of the most important aspects of our peer review model, which are approval statuses. Um, get the next slide. Oh. We, oh, oh, apologies. Do you want the previous slide? Uh, yes, previous slide, sorry. Okay. I think I've got a slight lag. Ah, oh, OK. Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, so as mentioned previously, peer reviewers uh, entirely decide whether a paper passes peer review on Open Research Europe, and we look for every paper to be reviewed by at least two experts. Now, as well as providing the textual report and answers to those questions that I outlined previously, each reviewer who agrees to submit a put, um, reviewer who, who submits a report also gives the article an approval status, and we have three status that can be awarded, as you see laid out here, approved, approved of reservations or not approved. And these determine the outcome of peer review. Basically, an approved means that there are very minor revisions, if any are all needed, and on the whole, the article is valid, it is already ready to be part of the academic or scientific literature. Anything else is basically just tidying sort of things up. And approved of reservations is chosen when the article requires uh, a number of small changes or maybe sometimes more significant revisions, but these are important or like crucial for it to be um, of a requisite kind of academic or scientific quality. And a not approved means the article in its current form is not valid and requires crucial substantial revisions to be made in order to pass peer review. Um, it's crucial to note that a not approved is not a rejection though, and articles, you know, in line with uh, a belief in sound science as well, Articles that have received not approved can be revised and can, uh, and we do have examples of articles that have received not approved, have been revised and have eventually passed peer review. <laughs> um, in order to pass peer review, each article requires either two um, statuses of approved or one approved and two approved with reservations. And um, we can see that indicated here, what that would look like. I must uh, kind of stress that for the most part, we will just invite two reviewers for most articles, but occasionally an article will have three reviewers, perhaps if it needed a third reviewer due to um, a specific uh, expertise that was uh, required to assess the article, like statistical expertise, or maybe if just like multiple reviewers agreed in the first round of interviews. Occasionally, we also invite a third reviewer as part of like a tie break scenario if uh, the first two reviewers disagree quite heavily on the article. Um, but in cases where the article hasn't passed peer review, and even in cases where it has, we always encourage authors to revise their article to address the comments that both reviewers have made. And if an article hasn't received two approved after it first to report, the only way for it to pass peer review is through a new version and through addressing the comments made by the um, reviewers. So if we can flip through to the next slide, I'll kind of give an example of what that looks like. Perfect. So one of the big things with the um, Open Research Europe and all F1000 platforms is we support article versioning and the fact that every article is a living document. So what we what this encourages is once an article has completed peer review, by which I mean has received two peer review reports, and say those reports, uh, say an article was, uh, to receive two approved reservations, clearly there was something that needed to be fixed in the article in the eyes of the reviewers for it to pass peer review. The author can then actively engage in this process and engage in a discussion between author and reviewer. So the author would ideally write a point by point response to the peer review reports, and this will then be um, published alongside a new version of the article to let reviewers and readers know what changes have been made to the article. Um, once the revised version of the article is uh, published, we invite re-invite the original reviewers so that they can assess whether the article has improved based on their comments. 
And so at this stage, the reviewer can update their status. And um, it's important to notice that uh, note out as well that regardless of peer review outcome, whether an article passes or not, articles remain published and can't be removed or taken elsewhere. This is again in line with our commitment to transparency. Each article has a DOI, it's got permanency of content. And that does encourage people to also, you know, kind of revise and engage with the criticisms of their reviewers. Articles can, in theory, go through many versions and all the revisions are available online. So the original version one of uh, this article would be available online. But then when um, visitors visited that page, they'd be informed that there's a new version that's updated, that's got perhaps an awful response to these peer review reports and things along those lines. And um, do do. And anyone can see the evolution of the article by like sort of maintaining the history of it, as well as the peer review reports that have helped shape and improve it. It makes our articles living as there's always an opportunity to submit a new version. And as this process is transparent, it'll always be clear why an article changed and what changes were made. And as you can see here, basically we've got an example of like good practice on ORRE. So there's a um, report that gives a short outline summary of the article that attaches a file that's accessible by anyone that gives like kind of more detailed line by line comments. And then we've got a specific response from the author to uh, the reviewer outlining any changes they made. And also this box here, the amendments from version one uh, outlines the broader changes that have been made and links through the, to the responses to each of the reviewers. So ideally what will happen at this point is what you can see at the, on the next slide. which is that an article will pass peer review. And I just want to flag here the various ways in which we make clear to uh, readers and authors what has gone on. So as you can see, um, the title includes the square brackets, and we do ask this to be included in all sort of citations. Uh, it tells you what version of the article it is. It tells you that it has received two peer review reports. On the right hand side in the box, you can click through to both the version one and version two peer review reports and any comments or responses that exist. Um, yeah, that's a very uh, kind of like streamlined overview of how the peer review process works. And I'll pass over back to Alicia. Um, hi, Joe. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, with um, these uh, final slides, I just want to um, summarize the benefits of uh, publishing with Open Research Europe. So the first one can be that uh, we are fast, or at least we aim to be faster than traditional journals because obviously we don't have to wait for the peer review process to be completed for the article to be published and for everybody to have access to it. Um, as I was mentioned already, we are trying to be uh, really inclusive uh, with any kind of uh, research outputs by offering different types of article types. We um, are open and we follow the um, Commission open access and open data um, um, sharing requirements. And we believe we are doing something against um, the uh, to fight the reproducibility crisis by making um, sure that all the data is published alongside the article. We follow, as you uh, see, a very transparent uh, process as we have um, an open and author driven uh, peer review. Um, process and um, finally we are uh, is an easy way for researchers to publish with us because the costs are directly met by the European Commission and they don't have to search uh, for the funding and finally if you want to know more uh, you can uh, follow this uh, link where you will find information about generally uh, what wow. we do all the links that I've included in the presentation as well um, we also have a blog where we um, talk about the different um, news uh, that we have if we've been indexed if we have also research uh, spotlights about the researchers that have published with us about the articles that we have published you can also follow us uh, on Twitter and uh, maybe in the future you will like to publish your research with us or work uh, as a reviewer. So with that, um, thank you very much for your time and we can open uh, for questions. I think I will stop sh sharing so I can see. Yeah, yes, I have a question, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for this um, presentation. I am fascinated by the Open Research Europe project. I am also 
uh, would like to promote it among uh, the researchers here in Slovenia, but I have heard comments uh, from the researcher side that uh, they are not planning to use it yet because it is still uh, at the conception stage. That is their perspective. And of course, it doesn't have an impact factor, uh, which is a problem here in Slovenia, where the researcher is still heavily quantitatively uh, evaluated. Um, so uh, what my question is, um, do you have an insight in who are the adopters of uh, Open Research Europe? So um, why? Uh, is there a specific community that is more, uh, let's say, prone to adopting Open Research Europe? And what is the the uh, what are the characteristics of the research research culture where they are coming from that um, they see uh, Open Research Europe as a viable option for publication in contrast to uh, traditional venues? Yeah, yeah, thank you uh, so much for pointing this out. Um, obviously, um, this kind of comments, the kind of comments I have when I have um, conversation with researchers. Uh, the first one you made about the conception that this in the early stages, uh, that's easily fixable because we just have to wait some time. Uh, obviously, all these traditional journals, when they started and they were only live for um, less than two years, they probably weren't as successful as we are um, so far. So this is something that um, we are working on that and it's, uh, we just need um, time to again be indexed uh, in more um, databases and uh, offer at least in the index um, side of things the same that other journals are offering researchers. Then in terms of the impact factor, um, this is something that the European Commission and is, is written like that on our website. Uh, we don't have an impact factor. I will not ask for one. So this is, has been an intentional decision. Um, and this is more or less following, as I was mentioning, there's um, different movements. Uh, I mean, they've been a, a, around for 10 years now, but there are different movements towards uh, using uh, impact factor and citation index uh, responsibly and don't uh, use these uh, two things just to um, um, assess researchers. And um, I don't know if you heard, but lately in July, the European Commission um, published a research assessment reform where they were very clear that they will uh, they use the they want to promote the, the responsible use of impact factor, but they don't want uh, the impact factor to be the only measure to assess the quality of researchers and the quality of uh, of research. So that's why I'm thinking that um, we are not going to have an impact factor in the future. And then you mentioned um, who are the adopters. So um, what we have seen is that this platform has been is very popular in social sciences. And uh, just from my perspective, I mean, I have a biology a background in biology and in biology, we have so many different options to publish similarly to what we do in Open uh, Research Europe. Like uh, you have um, peer community in, uh, um, we, you, we, you have eLife, so we have other um, journals that they don't do exactly what we do, but are within those lines of open um, science, whereas I think that in the areas of um, social sciences, this uh, gap um, hasn't been um, um, populated by other um, publishers or by other journals. So that's why we tend to be more um, popular there. And um, the reasons for uh, our authors to publish with us are um, very diverse. Uh, okay. Sometimes they just like what we are trying to promote. An other question can be that um, we had an author that he was finding troubled publishing the research that he wanted in another journal in terms of, um, I think he was mentioning like word limit. So our word limit for some um, um, article types tends to be more generous than for other journals. Or for example, they want to publish a specific um, type of data that is it doesn't fit in other journals. So we offer like data notes, for example, if they just want to publish a set of data without any discussion, we accept that, whereas other 
journals might not accept it. As I was mentioning, we also accept um, negative results. Usually tradition journals don't uh, like to publish uh, negative results because um, they don't get citations. So basically it will make the impact factor of the journal go down, whereas you are um, avoiding this research that has been done uh, rigorously to be um, accessible to everybody. So what's going to happen is that the next researcher will try exactly the same thing as you and fail and then it, it will never get published. So um, yeah, I think there are various reasons for our um, authors to engage with our model. And um, it's true that what you mentioned is, is a reality. I mean, there's many movements to change research assessment, but um, the way research researchers are assessed is uh, with the number of publication and and publications in high impact factor journals so i mean it's still early days um but we are hopeful and uh, now with the um with the backup of the european commission with this reform um assessment uh, reform reform of uh, research assessment that they are going to open for signatories in the 28th of September to see how many universities, how, how many funders uh, yeah. will be willing to embark in this new mission. Thank you very much. So I'm well aware of these developments regarding research assessment, but uh, unfortunately our uh, Research agency is uh, right now uh, reforming its internal acts and has doubled down on quantitative assessment, believe it or not. Okay. So I don't know how they're going to, uh, let's say, um, um, whether they will be able to pass that or not in light of the current development. But I'm very sad to see uh, the current situation in Slovenia. But uh, it is what it is. And uh, then uh, the evaluation procedures at research performing institutions of, in Slovenia depend on internal acts of agencies. So basically, if a uh, research agency blocks, um, progress, then everything downstream is blocked, regardless of what the research community would like to see. Yes, uh, yeah, and um, well, it's um, it's unfortunate. Uh, obviously, um, I think that the responsibility shouldn't lie on the researchers because obviously researchers, they just they don't need to be martyrs. Obviously, if they can publish their research in a venue that it will be more beneficial for them in the long term, uh, I will encourage them to do so. I, um, but they will still obviously if they have Horizon for 2020 funding to to publish with us, maybe uh, some research that they cannot publish um, somewhere else if they want to publish their negative results, if they want to try a different article type that doesn't have, is not cutter in other um, journals. And then also, um, yeah, I understand obviously the, um, the position of researchers in, in Slovenia, they cannot fight against the agency that is telling them if you publish there, it, it's not going to have any value. But uh, on that point, I just want to mention that it's something I didn't mention that um, the idea of Open Research Europe uh, is to include in the future different funders within Europe. So obviously there is a strength in numbers and um, it will. The idea is that funders from other um, European countries, I cannot give any names because this is um, still ongoing and they are having conversations with that. But the idea is that apart from um, be eligible because you have a uh, European Commission funding, you could also be eligible if you have national funding. For example, if you are in Germany, if you're in Spain and the national okay. funder bodies of these countries join. So it will just um, make a very strong statement of this is the new direction research publishing is going to. So you want to be a part of it or you will be uh, kind of like out. So um, hopefully this will um, convince other countries that are more reluctant to join us eventually. But yeah, I agree. It's, um, it's, it's a bit sad. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other question? Okay, so thank you very much, Joe and Alicia. I just did open a new
Okay, bye. Enjoy the rest thank of you. your day. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Bye. Bye.